to BBC Africa. My guest today is the presidential election flag bearer for the Sierra Leone People's Party. His name is Julius Mada Bio. Uh, Julius Mada Bio, welcome. Thank you very much. Elections are three, about three months away. How do you see your chances this time? Good. Very good. Why? Well, um, this is not my first time in politics. Uh, I've been around for a while. And uh, the first time was during the NPRC military government era. And um, people have fond memories of um, some of the things I did, which are still visible within the country. And um, when you go around Freetown and Sierra Leone today, people are quite happy to have me as their next president of the Republic of Sierra Leone. You haven't had enough of being in office or being in power? Well, I was only there for three uh, for three months um, as at the helm. I was uh, the deputy for a, a while before I became the uh, the chairman of uh, the NPRC. I I left for over. I've been out of politics for uh, going to about ten years, uh, twenty years actually, since I left office. So I'm back again. And um, I was the presidential candidate of the Sierra Leone People's Party in the last election in 2012. And I pulled nearly 40% of the vote. So this time around, I'm going to top it up. What's your strategy to win in 2018? Well, I wouldn't um, really delve into the specifics of my strategy on BBC, but I, I want to speak to some of the key issues, uh, socioeconomic problems that are facing uh, challenges that our country is grappling with, such uh, as uh, the economy, division, uh, no lack of social harmony, and um, the fact that uh, Sri Leoneans are not happy at all. So the bread and butter issues, because that is what matters to everybody. But how do you, if you're tackling bread and butter issues and you're working out a strategy, are you going to intimidate? Are you going to pay the voters? Oh uh, no! How are you going to get them to buy? I, I have a, me- a message that resonates very well with Sierra Leoneans. Uh, one of the things I have been talking about, which I will uh, just hint on now, is free education uh, from primary, pre-primary school to uh, high school. That is the end of um, secondary school. We have a country in which uh, three out of five adults cannot read and write. And we yet we talk about development. Everybody, every government has been talking about developing Sierra Leone. I think it is absolutely patent nonsense to talk about development when you have that sort of socioeconomic indicator that three out of five uh, adults cannot read and write. So free education, so free primary ed- and secondary. Primary and secondary. How are you going to pay for it? Good. I intend to pay for that by first stopping the leakages, uh, we have serious problems about um, uh, duty, duty free, uh, duty free uh, that has been given quite a lot by our government, tax exemptions to companies that really do not deserve it. And when you put that together, it's so huge. That alone, just taking care of that alone is enough to provide this very essential service of educating our pop- uh, our population. A- education is not cheap. You can't just say that by blocking up these these holes, you can actually pay for free primary and secondary education for all young Sierra Leoneans. It is so huge. We have worked the mathematics. Uh, it's so huge. The leakages in that area are so huge that they can actually take care because... Um, one, that is not just the area I'm going to emphasize on. We want to, I am going to lead a government uh, um, that is going to take care of the economy. The economy in Sierra Leone is sick. The macroeconomic uh, environment is not good at all. So one of the ways I am going to take care of the economy is to make sure that we diversify. What we have done in Sierra Leone is we, depend, we have depended for so long on, on the extractive industry. When you ask the Sierra Leonean what 
resources do you have? They don't count, start by counting themselves, which is the human capital, the most important capital that we have. They talk about diamonds, gold, uh, and everything in the world. But we have paid so much attention to that, that we as human beings, we have not developed the human capital. For me, that is a serious and unpardonable mistake. We must correct that now. And whatever the cost, we but, have to pay for that. Okay, blocking loopholes and diversification. But what's your ballpark figure in terms of what you're going to use to pay for this education? Um, I, 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 I cannot put, put that now, but I have worked the mechanics. Surely it's three months to go to election. No, 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 you should know how, how much it costs to educate young people. Yes, that, that is correct. What we have done is, um, that is, uh, everybody is asking that question. We have checked for um, a Sierra Leone, uh, a student in high school pays uh, 75,000, which is uh, 75,000 uh, Leones. <clears throat> What's that in dollars? Uh, the pounds is about seven, seven pounds, 50. Really? Yeah, yes. <laughs> that, and people are, for, are dropping out of school for that. So when, when, when I spoke about that, so what we have done is, what I, what I don't have here as I sit here now, like I cannot just uh, speak or um, uh, I can't just give to you, is the exact number. But what we have done is we have calculated that and the total enrollment. And we also know that besides paying, for their school fees, uh, people are dropping out of school because they don't have uniforms and schools. So we have calculated all of that, and that is what we intend to cover by taking care of the economy. Will the people of Sierra Leone know how much you're proposing before the election? Oh, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> I, I did not have that coming in here, but I, I can have that out of the, out of the studio. I have worked that. I, it, it's been, I didn't want to release that, but I, I, I don't have the exact figure now. But I've worked it out because that is the most important. How are you going to finance? It's very easy to say I'm going to give free education up to university. But the most important, how are you going to finance that in an economy that is shrinking? And that, but for me, education is so important that we have to find every means to make sure we can Indeed, but you're, you're practically beginning at zero, and then you're saying that you're going to implement this. Won't it take a bit of time but before you diversify and before you can block up all these loopholes? Oh, the, uh, the diversification definitely is a long-term process. Uh, what, that is why when you ask me, I said to you, we have serious leakages in our system. We have uh, um, um, a system that has been overspending in terms of uh, on projects that are not really important to uh, to the to the lives of Sierra Leoneans, what we want to do is to take care of um, manage our expenditure and also mobilize uh, uh, local or domestic revenue mobilization. We have to increase that. Those are those alone are enough to take care of our education system, which we have to fix. By the time we diversify, which is a long-term process and uh, which is a cross-section um, uh, thing, we will be able to have enough resources to get started on the free education that we want to provide for Sierra Leoneans. Indeed, let's, let's talk about you. Why do you think you should be the president of, of Sierra Leone? What qualifies you to be, to be the APC? and to be the next president of Sierra Leone? Well, um, my background is military, but I am reputed to have led the process that brought democracy back to Sierra Leone. In those difficult periods during the war era, I took the dif difficult decision of returning Sierra Leone to a, democratically, uh, uh, to a democratic dispensation. And I you'll govern as a Democrat? As a democratic person? Def definitely, because I believe in democracy. Otherwise, I wouldn't have uh, stood up for it at the time when most of uh, the region was actually led by uh, 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 military men. What I did was I went to Ghana, where they had just finished their transition program. I looked at it, brought it back to Sierra Leone. Um, I was there for a week understudied all the processes, the institutional arrangements that went into that. I brought it, um, adapted it, and then we prepared our own transition program for military 
to to a, a democratic civilian rule. So I led the process, and I had the the audacity to relinquish political power. And I left because I knew my presence within within the country would have always been a source of insecurity. So at the time I was at the helm, I delivered on two things. I couldn't bring the peace entirely, but I initiated the peace process by going into the bush, uh, getting our friends in West Africa, uh, get, going into the bush and getting for the Sanko and bringing him to the table. Okay. That is you, one. you did that. You're, you're a military man. Yes. But, but w- what other qualifications do you have? Where, where did you study, for example? Oh, okay. Besides my military, um, uh, um, I am, I'm a retired brigadier of the Republic of Sierra Leone Armed Forces. Um, I studied in America, University, School of International Service. But what did you study? I, international Affairs. I, I majored in, in, in Peace and International Development. And I, as I sit here, um, a couple of I have three more chapters to to submit to get my PhD in uh, peace studies at Bradford University. That is my academic background. But people refer to you as Doctor Bio, so you haven't yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe a, politi- a, a political doctor. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Uh, a lot of people call me. Uh, uh, no, I I didn't arrogate that to myself. Uh, a lot of people call me doctor because they think I deserve to be called a doctor, even before my academic uh, qualification is here. You mentioned that it was about twenty years ago that you were involved in in the politics. Some mm-hmm. people have argued that you've been unemployed for the past twenty years and you're not qualified to be president of Sierra Leone? Well, I, I have not been unemployed ever since. What have you been doing? It, I just went through. Um, when I left, it took four years for me to, to do my first degree, another two years to do my master's. And last, uh, I did the, uh, the past uh, f- three and a half years on my PhD program. I went back to Sierra Leone and I started a business and I employed so many people. What's I, a business? I, I was, uh, first I started with diamonds. I'm, I'm a certified diamond valuer. Uh, the only president, the only person who leads at that nation, who leads that nation uh, at the level that I am, I am at the moment, who actually understands the technical details of one of our greatest, our greatest assets, which is diamonds. And the I, technical I, loopholes also of avoiding to pay the dues that go to Sierra Leone? No. The, the, uh, when you do diamond valuation, you are not looking at uh, technical details to to just uh, avoid that. Be- when you do uh, diamond valuation, you actually study diamonds and how to value it rough. But because I was exporting, I you, you will understand the process of getting a diamond, buying a diamond, going through the legal processes and get it, getting it into the world market through the Kimberley process, of course, that we give you an understanding of the mark of the not only diamond itself, which is important, but also the the the, uh, the market of itself, which is really what I think you are trying to uh, understand. So you've been doing that for the past ten, twelve years. No, I didn't. I didn't do diamonds for too long. I didn't find it interesting, so I moved on to cocoa and coffee. I. I wanted to start off with agriculture, but I thought that it was better to start with trading in in agricultural products. So for three and a half years, I was involved with exporting cocoa and coffee. And within a very short time, I was in the uh, east of the country. I set up my company in in, in, um, concert with a British partner. And within a very short time, our cocoa coffee business became the gold standard in the sub in, in that part of the country. In fact, the whole country, because of the quality of uh, that we were dealing with, the technical input we put in there. Your international agencies who are going to, to us to teach the other businesses so that we can have a high premium on on our cocoa. So, are you still not, doing that? No, I had to put that aside to. Um, really embark on politics. And for the past four years, I was here. I was both in academia and politics. So you can, you can see that um, I didn't go searching for unemployment. I 
created a situation that employed a lot of Sierra Leoneans. And you can go to the east and ask them. I used to, once in a while, I would drive my own truck and go to the villages, sit down with them. Uh, I know how to process cocoa from the port. To the and field. you made enough money so that you can relax or continue with your politics? Well, um, um, I, I've been able to take care of myself uh, since I handed over, and I don't have any debt on any ba- in any bank in Sierra Leone. So I can say I'm comfortable. I know how to manage myself. And uh, unlike many other people who fall, you know, after power, fall from grace to, you know, and uh, they can't live within the expectation of people, I have, I, I think I, I can boldly say here that I have uh, lived within uh, the expectation of people. Mm-hmm. And the basic thing is that you're trying to govern the people of uh, Sierra Leone. Can you describe the state of the lives of the people of Sierra Leone now? I want to start by saying that Sierra Leone is a divided society in that uh, along ethnic, political, and uh, socioeconomic lines at the moment. It is not a happy country. We have a population um, of 7 million people. Two-thirds of that live on less than $1.25. We have a youth population that is 70% unemployed. We have uh, um, uh, a country where inflation is hovering at 18%. Um, When the SRPP that I'm leading now left governance in 2007, um, the exchange rate was 2,900. As I speak to you, 7,500 and climbing and going up every day. Just these few socioeconomic development indicators speak to the fact that we have a sick country that a, is not happy. A sick country basically almost at zero as you're describing it. And these, would, are, these are facts that you can confirm. How would you change that? I am coming with a disciplined approach to leadership. And I will start with myself to provide efficient political and economic management of the state and its resources. We are a rich and resourceful country, but we have been poorly governed. And what I want to do is to be able to provide quality governance, one that is efficient and one that is effective, to take care of some of the perennial ills of our society so that we can we can live as a happy people. You've talked of uh, governance, so you start by declaring your assets right at the beginning. Oh, yes. Uh, it's, it's a statutory requirement. And how would you tackle corruption? Corruption. Corruption, um, since the time of the Sierra Leone People's Party, a whole commission has been put in place, the ACC. And uh, over the years, we are the, the laws that should support the commission to function effectively have been, have been, have been passed through parliament. So very, then what's the problem? What, why is Sierra Leone so corrupt? I was very happy when uh, President Kroma took over and said there will be no sacred cows. What we have is a lot of sacred cows. Some people can go away with corruption, why others cannot. So we have unchecked corruption and it's systemic in the sense that uh, the, if, you, uh, if you look at our, our audit report, most of the complaints or most of the, prob- the challenges that you are highlighted there by the audit report, we are never implemented by the government. So the government itself is at fault because um, the, 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 one of the institutions is telling them this is what went wrong in these uh, uh, agencies of yours. So much has been done. And then they will just sweep it under the carpet. I will tackle corruption first by providing myself, like he, like President Kroma said, there will be no sacred cow. I will put myself out there and said, no one, not even my family member, will go scot-free if uh, there's any involvement. There's the issue of unemployment. It's a major problem right across the country. Do you agree? Correct. So what's your solution? I spoke, I started talking about the economy. We cannot deal with um, unemployment without growing our economy. 
we have to make it expand. We have to provide a policy environment, quite apart from the macroeconomic policy environment. We have to look at other policies that we make sure that we are the best destination for foreign direct investment. That way, we, we have companies coming in, we, we encourage local entrepreneurship, and once the economy expands, that is a way to provide, uh, to take our, our use of the street. But there, addition, there, there are lots of policies that are there, but they are not being implemented. Uh, that, is where the, that is where the problem is. Um, what I am going to do is to have a whole delivery agent, agency, a, a small unit, that is there to make sure that every policy that has that is well intentioned, properly formulated, is taken from just it's it's not left at the uh, rhetoric level. It is taken down to that level where it is implemented, so that it can have effect on the lives. It can deal with the social problems that we have in 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 our country. And just before I forget, um, we you just don't expand the economy and expect that it's going to take care. Um, in my human uh, capital development uh, uh, policy, we are going to make sure that we have a whole generation of people during the year who could not go to school. And uh, I call them the, the, the lost generation. We have to provide technical and vocational training for these people to, so that we give them the skills and employable uh, skills so that they will be uh, attractive to people who want to employ. But you talk, uh, you, you talk of these skills, but there's always uh, a problem. I was just wondering, first of all, what's your target? How many people are you going to get out of unemployment, for example, in your first year? We are looking first at uh, um, 500,000 people. Uh, we, we, half a million. Yes, half a million people. Um, uh, the, under the Human Capital Development Program uh, policy, uh, policy what we want to do is to make sure that there is um, uh, a technical and vocational training in every district in Sierra Leone. We have some of them now. We have to increase on that. The, 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 some people have argued against this vocational training. You, you, you create carpenters, you create mechanics, you create people who, who sew clothes or something like that. How many can the economy take? That is it. Um, we, we have an economy that's growing. Um, I mean, we have a nation that is growing very fast. Um, you, the, the public sector, el, sector alone is not enough. We are talking about vocational training, and we ju just don't produce tailors and carpenters. Um, we are talking about inviting or providing an environment that is very inviting to um, 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 foreign uh, investment. When these people come, they need people, but they're not just going to employ every youth. They want to know that they have skills that are directly uh, relevant to the employment they want to create. Let's say for IT, which everybody is using, I mean, it's essential. These uh, companies are going to ask for IT experts or uh, people who can operate, you know, who have the knowledge and skills. So we are going to look at not just carpenters, tailors, uh, the traditional thing. We are going to make the service industry. Service, all of these things. We have a, an economy that is growing, a world that is growing very fast. So we have to look at what is needed by these uh, uh, um, companies and then pro train accordingly, not just the carpentry and tailoring and uh, the other things that has, has been. But apart from unemployment, there's the issue of health, which is a, a big problem. Sierra Leone performs badly, he, especially as far as health is concerned. Huge numbers of people suffer and they die early unnecessarily. Yes, that falls under the human capital uh, development that I'm going to, I, that I've been talking about. How do you change the health system? Uh, that is a challenge. But it's a challenge that we must take on, otherwise we we'll all perish. Because as I speak to you, we have very few doctors left in that country. I mean, specialists. Maybe in the whole country, we don't have uh, up to five cardiologists. Specialists are not there. We have young men and women who are training. I think uh, there has to be a bold um, and targeted intervention on the part of the government in these areas to say that this is a threat to our existence. We train those doctors, send them out, and make sure we encourage them to go back and serve. For but, now, but apart from doctors, what about the primary health care centers? What are you going to do? Well, I'm, I'm, you're there building all these cardiologists, but 
You well, know, I, 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 the, if the, you just give me time, I we have why I started there. That is a fearful scenario when you talk about a country of seven million people and you have five cardiologists. We have to revamp the whole health system. The health governance system is one thing that the, the, it, it, it is difficult, in fact, in Sierra Leone to talk about priorities because everything is a priority in Sierra Leone. So when you talk about health, you you know that we, um, that is why when Ebola hit us, the, our, our, our vulner, vulnerabilities, we are exposed to the world. We didn't have a system that can even manage. We had to um, uh, ask for support from around the world. So again, one, like the uh, primary uh, health system that you're talking about, even thinking about hygiene and other things, Education is important. Our people have to know what is good for them and for them to take care of themselves at certain levels. And then the government will come in with those facilities like uh, uh, boreholes to provide safe drinking water for them, latrines for sanitary conditions. And uh, we have to cascade the other issues. I started at the top with medical doctors because for me, uh, that is just a frightening uh, thing to think about. Indeed. And... The other thing with Sierra Leone, what we know is that Sierra Leone is famous for its rich natural resources, but there's very little benefit that is going down to the the common person on, on the ground. How would you change the system? How would you get people to benefit from that wealth that uh, Sierra Leone has in the ground? Well, um, we have to uh, look at some of the laws, the policies, as far as the extractive industry is concerned. And that is where, I, I, like I said before, besides going to other areas to provide revenue for us, we have to make sure that this uh, sector, the extractive sector, which is really what we are known for around the world, we make sure that the governance of this sector is improved. We have to sit down with our, our partners those who are interested in that industry, those who are operating in that industry, and uh, do a sober reflection that we are known for these things, but we have not benefited in as much as we want you to benefit by because you put your monies into it. We also want to make sure that the country gets its own share. And but, then look, but, but how? Sober reflection, uh, what does it do? It, it won't put the money in, no, in the hands of the country. No, it, it, that, it's going to boil down to policies. Um, we look at the agreements, and we will see the agreements that are fair. And uh, like uh, we, you, I was talking about uh, duty waivers and tax exemptions. These, some of these companies under the present uh, government have been given duty waivers when they are making millions of dollars. You, I don't think they deserve that. If you are making millions, and we know you are, you pay your due, uh, 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 what is due to the state, so that the state also and the people can have what it takes to run and to, to, to do so effectively, efficiently. So we'll see a presidency, a by bio presidency, just saying that uh, these waivers are now stopped. No, uh, no, all of those, uh, b b b I mean, we had, some of them we involve actually going back to parliament. We're not just going to say, you know, we are going to look at everything um, forensically and look at what is not good for us. We, I talk about uh, dialogue and engaging these partners because we need them, but we also need our own share of what is coming out for our own people. We need that and to apply it to the needs of our people. So uh, it's going to be um, an ongoing conversation, and uh, we want to do so um, 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 with our partners, knowing that they will listen to us because it is not in their interest, and of course not in our interest, to, to have a system that doesn't care for its people. Let's talk about women. They're more than half the population, but most of them are severely disadvantaged and very underprivileged. What would you do to transform their lives? I have placed women, children, and the aged under a certain, uh, I would say these are the vulnerable uh, uh, um, uh, people, uh, uh, sector, uh, sections of our society. And under the human capital development, I have made provision for women 
the um and in fact that is why i the children i'm saying that we should care for them provision if, if, for if I, women say again provision for women correct yes what provision um <clears throat> we talk about inequality um uh, as far as women are concerned the last time let me just start by saying that the last time i contested for the leadership of Sierra Leone, 2012 my vice president or my running mate was um a woman um, that is a, a clear demonstration of my commitment to women. So will but you have I, a woman this time, a woman running away this time? <laughs> I am not sure. I'm still searching. Really? Uh, it's three months to the election? <laughs> yes, where I've just been, in, I've just been um, elected uh, just a little over a month ago. Uh, I told you we had our own share of problems within our party, which we have resolved. And uh, so I've not been... I could not have. Or, or you have another mind. candidate in mind that is going to be your running mate. Um, I'm, my 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 my. Uh, I, I'm looking at all the options. Unfortunately for me, uh, the lady I chose the last time is uh, ill at the moment, and definitely cannot uh, uh, take that position for now. So I'm looking at other options. It could be a woman. It could be a man. Yeah, there's been speculation that uh, former Vice President Sam Samana might be one of the, might be your choice. No. Uh, yeah. I, I see a bit of a smile. Yes, because uh, it's an interesting proposition. Really? Uh, he, <laughs> he, he, he leads a whole party. Mm. Uh, he's yet to go back, but he has his own party. I know him. We talk. Um, I, so you've been in touch with him? I've always been in touch with him. W should we watch this space? Um. Well, I, he, he, he intends to lead a party, and I'm leading one, the, the oldest party in Sierra Leone, for that matter, the largest party, I would say. And um, he's the head of another party. So we have to talk. I am encouraging dialogue across uh, political lines, definitely. So I, I talk to the others, and I see no reason why he and I should not be talking. We digressed a bit, but let's go back to our women. Mm -hmm. What is your response to to the call for political parties to implement a voluntary 30% quota for women candidates for parliament and local councils? And then at the party level, we have, in fact, a policy that talks about that. And we ha it's been hard to put that on the ground. But in fact, uh, just before I left, we, we, are, we had given that instruction at all levels to make sure that women, we are able to put 30, the 30% 30 that is in our own policy, we have a gender policy in our party. Um, but, but again, let me go back to the education stuff. We are saying that every any girl who proceeds to university and is doing the sciences or, or, or um, is doing the sciences will be supported. Uh, we will be supported by the government. That is because we really want to make sure that they are also able to the 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 imbalance that was created. We are in a lot of women are not given equal opportunity to 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 climb the um, the social mobility ladder that they are given that opportunity. So that is one, and um, it is our policy within the party that thirty percent of women are given uh, are, are given positions. We, we provide that space for them. It's been extremely difficult. Sometimes we don't have them coming up. Even when we encourage them, they, they, they are shy because of but, cultural but, and other barriers. But um, we are pushing very hard to make sure that we reach our 30% quota, which you've created for them. Okay, it's half the population of Sierra Leone, or Correct. more than half. Or, or more than half of the okay. population. So make them a promise right now. I've That's been, what you will do when you're president, that I'm going to do this for the women. I've been always committed to women who constitute more than 50% of our population. And my commitment has been demonstrated beyond doubt. I Make them a promise. When, if I had succeeded, I was going to have a, 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 a vice president. My vice president was going to be a woman. And I promise now that uh, the policy to make sure that we have a 30% women representation within our party is going to take hold. And we will translate that at the national level when I lead this country as the next president. Now, in Africa, it's often been said that it's difficult to beat an incumbent party. And supporters of the governing APC party, they often boast that they have 99 tactics 
to get what they want. What do you have up your sleeve to circumvent this? The people. I think the people have made up their minds. I gave you the stark reality, which is the the gloomy socioeconomic development indicators, and that one is being felt by everybody, including the APC. You only have to be a Suradinian to know that it is time for change, and the APC can no longer hold. Uh, the, but, but you're going to the polls as a divided party. No, we are not. Uh, that is a wrong impression. We there are schisms within your party oh, which have weakened it. No, it didn't weaken it. It has strengthened strengthened us. We've learned from that, and uh, we are we we don't talk about schisms anymore in, in the SRPB. Uh, we are over and done with that. Now we are going forward as as a united party. I I have spoken to the policies that matter to the people, and they know when I speak. I speak from my heart. I am a politician, but I've been there before. And when I say I'm going to do it, they know I will do it. Is that enough to dislodge an incumbent party? Uh, that is enough to know uh, that, I mean, the people know I have the benefit of hindsight in, as far as uh, the leadership of the country is concerned. I'm the only one who's been there before who has the track record of promising and delivering. Uh, so or do other uh, candidates are going to make promises, they know that the promises I've made, are we deliver on. Today, there's uh, the auction of that uh, very powerful big diamond that was uh, discovered. I think the auction is in, in America. What price would you put on it? <laughs> As somebody who has past experience. <laughs> Unfortunately, every diamond is different. And they have uh, peculiar characteristics. I didn't have the opportunity to loop it, to look at it under uh, the, the magnifying glass, to look at the color, to look at the impurities, to look at the shape and the different um, 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 factors that we, we put into the calculus when we give a prize to a particular diamond. I've seen it only on, uh, in social media, so I don't want to make a wide guess at all. This pastor who found it all with his group handed it over to the government. How would you want these proceeds to be shared? Well, in my opinion, the government has always, uh, there is a policy. Uh, 3% goes to the government. You pay uh, uh, um, when you want to export. And uh, the pastor or the group, they own their diamond. They have a license to, I'm sure they have a license to mine. They have a, and whosoever they are going through has a license to export. So when the diamond is valued, 3% should go to the state. I, I have not checked again if there have been any new taxes on that, but everything that is due to the state should go to the state. They, besides that, uh, they have no obligation to anybody to pay any other amount. They took the risk and they've been lucky and they've been paid off. They should uh, have the benefit of um, um, whatever comes from the diamond. What would you do to change the lives of those people who are putting their lives at at risk to get these diamonds? Well, um, diamond education is important for them. Um, a lot of people who are mining, that was, in fact, it was that uh, curiosity that actually led me to go and learn about diamonds. A lot of our people, 90% of those who are mining, don't even know what diamonds are. They, I mean, they rough because you have to know to be able to value a diamond in its raw state. You have to know what it will come out with when it is caught and polished. Because it is the caught and polished price that we determine how much you buy it at rough. These are that people don't know, and a lot of the people who are also trading in that don't know. So it's a matter of just looking at it, making rough. And um, if you are dealing in diamonds and you don't know the value of it you are going to be robbed off, and that is what has happened to us as a nation. So I we give them diamond, a level of diamond education. We should provide a situation, uh, a facility for them within the country where they can have independent assessment of these diamonds before they are sold off. And the state should provide that or um, help them value their diamonds and then say, you cannot sell below this. 
Anything below this is going to be a ripoff. Don't accept it. You have children? I do. Final, if I can say a few words, what will you wish for children or the, or the children of Sierra Leone? What is your hope and wish for them? Uh, for the children of Sierra Leone, today you are children, but you are our future. The best thing I want to leave for my own child is quality education. I want my children to have the best education in the world so that they can take care of themselves and their communities and Sierra Leone. And that is what I am going to provide for Sierra Leone. The best thing I want for my own child, which is quality education, is what I want to provide for Sierra Leone for free because it is the best. It is good for personal development. It is good for national development. And it frees you and make you, makes you competitive around the world. Elections are in three months' time. How do you want them to go? How do you want the campaign process to go? Uh, the, the campaign has not uh, started in earnest. Uh, I have been going around to say thank you because I was elected democratically by uh, delegates from around the country. Uh, but um, um, we are going around and telling people, and I will tell you one interesting thing. I have been talking about free education, and it's, it's when you go to the villages, people who cannot read or write, when you tell them, I am going to provide education for your kids, they jump above the roof. Will it be a peaceful process? I am committed to a very peaceful process. I'm a peaceful person, and on my part, and on the part of my party, I will, I promise Sierra Leone that I will not do anything to undermine the peace that I have uh, been, I have a vested interest in it. And uh, I will t continue to talk to the youth and Sierra Leoneans so that we have a very peaceful, we don't need a single drop of blood. We don't even need a bruise on anybody's shoulder or knees. We need just a peaceful process to elect our next set of leaders. Julius Madabio, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me.